Our planet Earth is also known as the Blue Planet because 71% of Earth's surface is comprised of water. There would be no life on this planet without it, since most living things, including us human beings, rely on water to survive. Did you know that a person can live about a month without food, but only about a week without water? That is why it is highly necessary that we should conserve our water efficiently and maintain every body of water clean. Conserving water is important for us so that we all have more water to consume in the future. We must learn how to conserve our limited supply of water just by checking leaks and taking shorter showers. If we do not maintain the state of our water clean and contribute to preserving our water, the cycle can be collectively disrupted because of the existence of invasive species. They can easily disrupt and affect the water cycle functions. For instance, tamaric shrubs and its entire species consumes a large amount of water which prevents other plants to grow and flourish. On a management level, policies and laws were made to protect and manage water resources better. In the Philippines, there are several laws and regulations that have been enacted for the protection, conservation, and management of water resources. Presidential Decree No. 424 of 1974 created the National Water Resources Council to coordinate and integrate water resources development. Number 2. Executive Order No. 222 of 1995 established the Presidential Committee on Water Conservation and Demand Management, which was tasked to prepare a nationwide water conservation plan. Number 3. Republic Act No. 8041 or the National Water Crisis Act of 1995 addressed the country's water problems through an integrated water management program and development of new water resources and conservation of identified watersheds among other provisions. Number 4. The Philippine Clean Water Act of 2004 also provided the comprehensive water quality management. In 1580 CE, Bernard Palissy was the first man to discover and describe the concept of the hydrological or water cycle that is still being used up to the present moment. In the first process of the water cycle, which is the evaporation, the water from the Earth's surface escapes into the atmosphere as molecules of water vapor. This happens when the sun increases the temperature in the rivers and oceans until it evaporates and transforms into a gaseous state or the water vapor that is mentioned earlier. Apart from evaporation, sublimation and transpiration also contribute to the whole process in the water cycle. Sublimation is part of the cycle where the ice from snowy regions mainly in the North and South Pole, directly converts into water vapors without transforming into liquid water first. This process advances when the pressure is high or the temperature is low. The transpiration, on the other hand, is quite similar to the evaporation process itself. The only difference is the liquid water that is being absorbed is coming from the plants. As the roots of the plants absorb water to carry out photosynthesis, the excess water moves out through the small opening of the leaves called stomata, which then enters the biosphere and transforms into a gaseous state. After that, condensation happens. It is when the water vapor in the air gets cold and changes back into tiny little particles of liquid, forming clouds. If the temperature is cold enough, it might even form into small ice crystals. Condensation plays an important part in the water cycle because it contributes to cloud formation. They possess the capacity to produce precipitation after clouds are created. Through transportation, the condensed clouds are then moved from oceans and other bodies of water to the land masses with the help of wind currents, land breezes, and sea breezes. The precipitation process initiates in clouds. As the water vapor from evaporation cools down and condenses into tiny solid particles, tiny droplets of water that are being held up in the clouds group together to form larger particles which then fall from the sky due to their own weight. Throughout cooler altitudes, 
the sub-zero water particles tend to form into ice crystals accumulating with nearby ice crystals to form a bigger one and fall to the ground as snow. But in hot climates, the usual accumulation of ice crystals that starts as snow tends to melt before reaching the ground. Due to gravity, as precipitation falls back into the ocean or land, precipitation flows over the ground and surface runoff happens. A part of the runoff flows through the valleys of the region, with the remainder of water flowing into the oceans. Runoff and groundwater leakage is collected and deposited as fresh water in lakes. Not all rain flows into the water, however a lot of it is soaked in. Infiltration is the process by which rain that falls into the land surface enters the soil. When the soil becomes saturated, rainwater may flow over land as surface runoff and will join other bodies of water such as streams, lakes, and oceans. In the percolation process, as the water seeps deeper into the layers of soil or permeable rock, it will reach the surface below and be stored as groundwater and leads into the ocean. In the plant uptake transition, the plants will take the water from the groundwater through their roots and releasing it back through evapotranspiration. This is evaporation from the soil and water surfaces and transpiration from plants. Plants will suck up 1% of water and the other 99% will return to the atmosphere. The process called groundwater flow happens due to the pressure and gravity of the earth. Some of the water from precipitation falls onto the land and infiltrates into the ground and converts into groundwater. Now this groundwater moves vertically, horizontally, downward and sideways until it eventually emerges back to the land surface, rivers, lakes, and into the oceans to maintain the whole continuous process of the water cycle going. Human beings are also part of this cycle. We drink fresh water that we get from glaciers, lakes, reservoirs, ponds, rivers, streams, wetlands, and even groundwater. Then after consuming the water inside our bodies, it will eventually get out of our bodies through perspiration and urination which will then be combined with other liquid water to begin the cycle again. And that is basically the whole process of the water cycle. In relation to epigenetics, they seem to have a correlation with the environment as it tends to supply and provide to the phenotypic diversity and defends itself from these certain oppositions. With this, the stress levels and transformation in the expression of genes have now been boosted. An example we could connect this to would be in perhaps improving crops. Crops tend to have variations of breeding processes which may seem dull, time-consuming, and costly as well, which actually says a lot about itself as they are unable to meet the degree and demands which this world where we currently live in needs. Albeit with epigenetics, they provide huge benefits that have the potential to possibly improve the change in plants that attributes to yield and nutritional quality by the creation of noble epialleles and transgenic RNA. This RNA interference is still used today to enhance certain crops we consume such as wheat, soybeans and many more. They are mostly used to intensify or add flavors and most importantly to lessen the anti-nutritive constituent 